Try to it's also actually that one. There we go. So link on there. Can you give me one second? I just want to see what it looks like. It's great. It's quite great to be. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Cool. All right. How's it best? Um, so my hobby essentially is tracking the politics and science to it. And I've been doing it for years and years and years. So I thought what I'd take you through today, it's quite hard to get through to you. I'm sure I'm not going to get through to what I take you through today is kind of observations and trends that I've noticed over the years, culminating in where we're at today um, at the start of 2019. I go to the beginning part of the quick and maybe spend more time to the uh, current space the So what I do is um, I collect data on Twitter, so say I'm interested in um, uh, land expropriation, you will Collect every tweet that has the word land, the phrase land expropriation, and hashtag land expropriation, and WC. You build up a query of, of related terms that are going to meet you, your data set, related to it. And then that data set will be users talking about the topic. And what you can do is um, you can extract those users and connect them together. So you might have Cyril talking to Helen and um, these are tweets, hacking each other, retweeting each other, Kim Bluey might be in there, Lucy and Julius. And every time they add mention each other or retweet each other, so they interact with each other, we draw a link between the two of them. And what you end up with is a, is a network of links. And then you can do some statistics on that to find out that actually there's a group over here talking more amongst themselves than this group over here talking amongst themselves. And so you can find the individual communities that are discussing amongst themselves. And because you know the birds were fed the flock together, the monthly people, group of like minded people usually. So you end up with very homogenous. Sets of conversations, you get a clear idea of what kind of agenda, uh, agenda is going on, or what kind of content resonates with that group, what makes them different from the next group. So it's a really neat way of finding out what constituencies involved in a discussion around a topic. So now, what I'm going to show you now is a whole bunch of those networks. And I'm going to start with 2012 when I started looking into this kind of stuff. And it's what I refer to as the age of innocence. Um, this is a big snapshot of what South and Twitter looked like back then. And, um, the main communities were sportsmen, celebrities in green, I mean blue. Um, you have the news media in there, in purple, and um, obviously early adopters being technology bloggers. Um, uh, the whole of black Twitter was in one corner of it mostly, and um, you had a kind of a Cape Town DA thing going on down there. And then we went to 2014, and um, I was looking at the elections that year. Got a really big data set, about a million tweets discussing the elections and about three months leading up to the elections. And when you looked at the network there, it was a really interesting one because it was basically a, a conversation at four communities. You had um, kind of the liberal DA kind of community in blue, you had the EFF um, in orange speckled throughout there, and then you had what looked like an ANC community and a lot of the official mouthpieces. Um, uh, talking, but it wasn't a very engaged community. They were mostly kind of just reacting to um, official statements and things like that. And then you had this really, really engaged community, kind of grassroots community that it was really difficult to figure out what they were about. So, but when you dive into the data, what, what I realized in 2014 it was about, what the data set was about, was that the ANC elected uh, voter stance and Jacob Zuma had split the ANC electorate in two. Was, and it cleaved off the younger voters into the separate community over here. So when you actually looked at the content between these two, these were very informed voters talking to each other one on one on the ground. There were no real influences that were leading them. In a sense, they were rudderless or, or, or decentralized in, in, in their, their discussions. And all that was happening in the original pro ANC community was there were people who were not politically engaged, just retweeting whenever some official ANC message came out or um, some, you know, Liking a meme by Fakir Bulu, but not really engaging with, with the political process, unlike this group over here. So in 2014, on Twitter at least, Jacob Zuma really split the election in two. And um, he left this whole group of 
young, politically engaged South Africans kind of residents. Without a political home, at least. And 2015 came along, and, and that community kind of coalesced and worked Twitter around things like Feeds Must Fall and, and all those kind of things. And this is a snapshot of um, Feeds Must Fall. It's about 500,000 tweets covering the, some of the original Feeds Must Fall um, demonstrations. But even at this stage, it was still a pretty centralized conversation. Um, you, you, again, you didn't really. You had the mainstream media covering it over here, um, but by and large, this was a very decentralized conversation, a ground root, grassroots conversation with um, very diverse communities. You had both of us fall in the mean, so we more of a Cape Town kind of focus. Um, you had more of a Vitz focus, um, which that was actually more Victoria. Um, Vitz, and probably the only voice that was anything close to influence in this scenario was the Daily Box. Um, and you had the EFF in there to a degree, but not. Massively so. Um, and you also on the periphery because space matters here. You had kind of the, the, the DA and the ANC both trying to get in on the conversation by kind of being crowded out because they kind of lack legitimacy at this kind of grassroots level of decentralized conversation. Well, what was at the top of the council? Sorry. And so, um, that was a American woman who um, tweeted about, if you recall, when. Um, the, the white students formed a human barricade in a garden, uh, down at Rondebosch um, police station, preventing um, some of the students who had been arrested, I think, from going into the station, out of the station, protecting them. And um, this was a, a woman from, I think she was a Black Lives Matter influencer. Don't, don't hold me to that. And so this is a separate international conversation where a, an American picked up on one aspect of it, and a lot of other Americans retweeted it. So it, it was almost like a side conversation. And going into 2016, things had kind of settled down. Um, and in the middle of 2016, we know that we had to look at what's all that kind of stuff. But going into 2016, um, I threw a whole bunch of data sets covering you know, things like the, the UFS brawl, um, State of the Nation address, any kind of like social, social political events I kind of measured. Into, during 2016, I threw into a single data set to look at what are the macro communities that were emerging in our political discourse in 2016. And if you look at this map, what our politics looked like was you kind of had two halves to it. You had kind of like free market liberal leaning, and you had more like socialist leaning, and you had the mainstream media. And we are very lucky in South Africa in that we still have a single touch point in our mainstream media, unlike in America today. We haven't had that delegitimization process lead to multiple sources of truth yet. Um, and that's always been one of our strengths, is that our departure points in our political discourse on Twitter has always been from a single common media touch point. There might be, there is a continuum within here of, of, of politics and whatnot, but it is still a single media touch point at the stage. So that was what it looked like going into to 2016. Um, you had the DA, you had the EFF, you had the ANC. Um, and then along came the rise of bots, trolls, and soft puppets. And just to just to make a distinction between them, because they often get referred to interchangeably, they're very different things. A troll is an unpleasant person who is spewing vitriol on the internet, not in a particularly coordinated fashion necessarily, just because they aren't happy at home or whatever the case may be. A troll is just a nasty person. Um, and that's the stereotype from South. A soft puppet is a troll that is part of the coordinated agenda. It's a real human being that is being coordinated to uh, further some kind of agenda. Like we, we have the IRA in, in, in Russia and all those kind of things. Those are, um, that's what we had with, um, with the Gupta bots. Is we had um, a, a social media agency set up in, in India, most likely, um, who um, was working a 95 job under contract. Uh, defining so, uh, social media campaigns as if you were a digital agency and using multiple people to affect those campaigns. So the real people, soft puppets, several hundred of them it seems, or several hundred accounts, difficult to say people with hundreds of accounts. Um, and then on the far end of the spectrum you get bots, not real people, automated accounts controlled by algorithms and rules. Um, you know, for example, 
they, they, they steal other people's profile images, they randomly generate the names, and, and they you get the, and all those, these guys generally just used to um, put a piece of content out there, and then you point a whole bunch of bots at it, they retweet it, it gives it an air of, of social legitimacy, so now a real user comes along and says, oh, it's really got 50 retweets, it's worth my attention. That's generally what bots get used for. Whereas the, the real the hard work is done by humans. And they work in tandem. So the humans put out content and the bots amplify that content. So to, to use another example from a, a, a paper, um, what, what you might do is you might have a media property, um, your um, various uh, fake news and, and highly partisan news sources that we have around the world. They might have put out something that's spurious or heavily uh, biased, and um, that might get shared by soft puppets in a coordinated fashion, people who are in a WhatsApp group or, or some another way coordinated. Um, that might get put out by a, a fake or a real influencer, and bots will get pointed at it and it will get amplified. And um, someone, another real influencer or the same influencer, might then, on the basis of the fact that it's been amplified, they might share it with a really existing social legitimacy from all the retweets into their real community of users, and that community then picks up and runs with the story. And then we all pick up and run with the story. And that's how the narrative gets driven and, and, and defined. So how did this play out in South Africa? Well, the first time that we became aware of it. The first time I became aware of it was in mid-2016 when I was looking at the data set about um, the public protectors report, I think it was. Um, state capture or one of those reports. Um, so there's a data set around one of the public protectors reports. And a community kept, jumped up that I'd never ever seen before in all of my previous years of looking at this data. So like going into 2016, these kind of communities had all been in that in that, that macro picture. This community that contained the crypto media and the real had never been there before. And um, that piqued my interest. And um, when I, I wrote an article about it, uh, and um, got docs for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when you looked into it, what you found were these users that had all been created on the same day or, or in batches. If you what was Twitter, like they'd been like 50 would be created in one day and then 50 would be created another day. And if you looked at how many reach, how many tweets they posted, they were all moving in lockstep. And if you look at the network, so you took these users and you connected to them because they were retweeting each other, you're referencing each other. We ended up with a network like this, where you have one or two influencer accounts that someone who was controlling would inhabit and put some content out, and then they take their other accounts and they point them at that content and they use it to boost it. And then um, uh, that content would be further amplified by um, various admins of the Great Economic Transformation community. Um, and it would then get out into the mainstream discourse, and you'd end up with a news articles. And in this case, you know, the first thing, one of the first things we have to thank them for is the popularization of the white monopoly capital return. What's interesting about the crypto bot uh, phenomenon, though, is um, this is this is the um, the volume of tweets by the crypto bots in the run up to the ANC fifty four election conference in December twenty seventeen. And they, they massively ramped up their um, their efforts in that time. And after uh, Silicon Mombasa was announced to win, within a matter of four days, they, they actually just dropped off. And um, their last tweet, uh, except for one automated, what we think is an automated tweet, was um, at the end of the December, which is obviously when their contract ran out. There was no need to continue fighting at that stage. So that was the end of the Gupta bots, as far as we know. But there was also a very heavy-handed approach to doing things, and a very expensive approach to doing things. Someone had to have a lot of money to keep a, 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 a room full of people running 24-7, fed with content and, and strategies. Not that the other methods that are being used are any less expensive, I guess, potentially. Amplifying tweets with bots is very cheap. For $10, you can, you know, so you can spend $10 and get like 1,000 retweets or something on any content you want. Um, but actually, having content that looks real and that can affect the discourse of a sustained period of time is more challenging. So that was the good bots. Then the, the big piece of research I did last year, was it last year I mean, it, Yeah, last year. Um, was I took a whole bunch of data sets, about 30 data sets covering a variety of topics in South Africa. 
And I was, I'd come up with a new methodology and I thought, well, it's really hard to spot bots, but the people that are probably the best at it because they have more information than the rest of us on Twitter. And Twitter at that stage had just, um, in middle last year, had just ramped up their fight against bots in, due to a lot of pressure that they'd come under. And so I thought, well, let me go back and look at some of my old data sets and see which ones um, contained many users suspended by Twitter. Which ones had Twitter had contained users that had been subsequently booted out by Twitter to get an indication of um, whether Twitter had picked up um, suspicious behavior in these guys? With the caveat that Twitter will suspend you because you're vitriolic or because you have suspicious behavior. So, still not 100% clear always whether these people are just, you know, um, racist, misogynistic, and violent, or whether these people are um, demonstrating behaviors that are non human like posting 24 hours a day without any sleep, or posting too often, or, or moving in lost with other accounts in a way that doesn't seem natural, those kinds of behaviors can also be red flags. But what I did was I took 30 discussions or topics across South Africa um, over about three or four years, and I looked into which ones had Twitter essentially identified the most suspicious behavior. And so this is what came out of it. And the red ones are the most interesting ones. Um, the green ones are, are um, I put in as control, so in theory, they're the ones that I thought wouldn't contain any suspicious behavior. Um, and then the yellow ones were ones that happened after Twitter did a massive cull of fake accounts we heard at that time. So, um, just starting with the green ones, why are those up there? Turns out, obviously, Super Bowl is the single biggest media event in the world on Twitter, and obviously, you can have a ship of spam being set up at that time, which is why it's a fake accounts. And Telecom was a fantastic example because some guy was not getting any love from telecom support accounts, so he ought to bear several hundred or thousand bots to telecom's account to, to catch their attention. So that's why that's so high up there. Turns out Mandela is more loved around the world than we would ever realize. The world loves Mandela. And when Mandela Day came around, um, it's, a national, it's an international event, and um, especially in South America. A lot of um, spam purveyors love to, to jump onto my dead day to kind of like, get their message out. And then that leads us to the red ones. And the three that were the most, um, had the most suspicious behavior were the Black Monday Farm Killings March, the anti farm killings march, you know, when farmers went and cavalcade down there to um, Hillens's legacy of colonialism tweet and the ANC 54 conference. And now there were other ones that were sort suspicious. Um, those are the three that I looked at detail. So this is the ANC 54, and what I've done is I've highlighted in green where there's a suspended account. So what we're doing here is we're looking for where there are clusters. You know, you'd expect there'd be a random distribution of suspended accounts because there are assholes everywhere. So that wouldn't be surprising, but when you start to see a density of uh, suspended accounts in one place, you might see a community that is more racist and violent and vitriolic than everyone else, or um, showing more suspicious behavior. I would argue that it's probably easier to get suspended for suspicious behavior than it is for being a racist, vitriolic person. So probably leaning more towards suspicious behavior. And if this is the, the discussion on AT54, if you look at who that was, that's um, the Radical Economic Transformation Group, including the Gupta Media, the BLF, and uh, a guy called Adam ITV, who does a lot of the, the boosting of um, content for them. And the kind of, how, how do we know that they're probably using bots? He has an example of him tweeting something, pointing a bunch of bots at it, and getting uh, getting social uh, getting social cash out of that. Notice all the ones that are suspended for uh, that are retweeted in the place in America. So my hypothesis here is that given that the USA is the main main flashpoint for this kind of behavior, um, if you're going to be uh, temporarily renting some bots off of the international black market, it's not worth those bot this time to repurpose them with South African profiles. To, make, to show some legitimacy. Um, all he was doing was he was just reprinting American bots that um, generally will then go back to you know uh, pushing alt right, um, far right uh, sentiment to America. Um, and actually, uh, Ben uh, also wrote an article, Ben's team also wrote an article at the time, Ben's before identifying him, and then said it's pretty much the same stuff. Um, so then we need to hear this legacy of colonialism tweet. Which is actually one, two, three, four. It's like a thread. It's a lot of thread. Um, and 
again, uh, if you look, what you want to look at is where the clusters of suspended users, and you, know, you, you can see this one going over there, there, and over there, and if you look at that cluster, um, it's, uh, you know, so <coughs> this is, you can't say that this is, this. so the interesting thing about this is just because bots retweet someone doesn't mean that that person knew that those bots were going to be retweeting them. So, well, uh, so if you take the NC54 thing, for example, what someone was doing was, you had a timeline of the tweets, and the only thing that they agreed with, they would just say boost, 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 boost. And so you end up with quite a variety of mainstream influencers and people that are possibly political by being boosted by, by someone. So it, um, you can't say for sure that you know, these people knew what was going on. But in the case of Hidden Zilla, uh, the community, again, it was a lot of tweets by MITV, um, tweets by the Zone um, uh, Jack Randy News was retweeted by them, something that said, they said that was aligned with the uh, message that they were trying to, to put out. So, uh, some more at MITV, more based mostly in America. Uh, boosting A and and boosting black person and first, etc., etc. It just goes on and on. Um, and then for the last example is the Black um, Monday protest, because an interesting trend in South Africa is that the um, uh, the, the, the white electorate the, the, um, is, is, is kind of being torn in two um, or heavily pulled towards more conservative ideals and that's mostly being accomplished through um, our connection with the international alt-right. Um, so uh, Black Monday's protest farm killing. How can you just give us a bit of understanding of this, this geometry of having this core cluster and then these circular so those things have meaning, right? Um, something's going to be in the middle when it is being engaged with from all sides. Um, something that's more likely to be in some, some of the filter bubble or like side conversation is going to be more on the periphery. <coughs> so, which is why you always see the mainstream media in here, um, and the, along with the politicians who are effectively, who are particularly effective at harnessing the mainstream media, like uh, a lot of the EFF leaders. Um, and Kim Bullard is really good. So you, you often find that mainstream leaders and political leaders sit separately to their actual political communities. Um, which also shows the symbiosis between media and, and politicians. Um, Would you call those side lobes uh, like echo chambers? Yes. So that, those are where the narratives are built, that's where the consensus is formed. Um, you know, what we had with in 2014 was this whole group of literally been cleaved off. Was decentralized, there were no influences. That's no longer the case. Those, in, those guys have been reconstituted around different influences and around single narratives. And so we have uh, a few communities instead of this diverse, diversity of you know, that momentary spark to life is as well. Um, so this is the Black Protest, the Black Monday protest. And um, again, you can spot right away there's something going on there, there, and there's something there going on here. And to your point, to your question, this is almost like a, like a cancerous growth sitting onto that thing. You can see it's not sitting neatly in with the rest of the conversation. What could that be? Well, this is the international alt-right that is interfacing with the South African uh, far-right. Um, people like Michael Solovich, Stephen Molyneux, Katie Hopkins, all commentating on our, um, our politics. Um, and when they do so, whenever the international alt-right enters our politics, the bots flow in as well. Um, at my TV, and then, so I, I did an update in my 2016 analysis where I threw it earlier this month. And what we what I found, what I think is that we have we're kind of not on a single global, it has the same kind of conversations and ideologies as international black Twitter. If you're part of the, the far right community, you have the same conversations whether you're in Norway or whether you're in um, America. And so what's happening is that everything's kind of moving in lockstep. Which also doesn't go well for future polarization. Uh, but, but we still have a common media attachment at this stage. It's still there, which is great. Mm -hmm. So, this is my, I actually started at the end of NC54 up until the end of 2018, just kind of like that was a mark line in the sand. And this is the volumes of suspended users over that time, just to get an idea of what events were causing spikes in possibly interference. Um, so we, we saw ANC 54 was, was without a doubt the highest, um, all pro NDZ. Um, Winnie Mandela's death, which was a, a 
area where there's a massive historical revision of you know the place in society and, and the people who associate themselves with it. Um, and yeah, the cats of Venice one I still haven't quite fully understood, but um, it's, a, it's a real standout data set for me in terms of um, stand and for people who don't know about Ben, this was an incident where this guy released a racist video. It was a major race event um, that you know, and they have these very regular stuff, and they do a lot of harm to kind of race relations. So the fact that uh, something like Madame Katzevinis event is one of the most um, uh, spikes in terms of that potential interference says to me that potentially something is trying to drive some That's what it looks like the, the picture, um, and um, basically what you have is America. Sorry, not America. The international world. We're weighing in on our conversations, mostly around race events and um, uh, white conservative ideas like palm killings and white genocide. Um, so the, the South can push is up over here. In fact, I don't need to be up to the point. Um, so again, mainstream media in the middle, common departure point, radical economic transformers. Over here, basically, mostly white South Africa, but down here in the liberal part of it, it, it there's, there's a diversity of people that it's not all white, but what happens is it kind of goes up into Afri Forum, keeps going to St. Lunders, keeps going into the ultra right, into the American ultra right. Um, and um, down here you have Black Twitter, which is heavily intertwined with the EFF. Um, over here you've got Black Twitter from the rest of the African continent, um, Black Twitter from the rest, sorry, the rest of the world, the rest of the African continent. Um, and then the US alt right and the US left, um, which is kind of like the, the counter point to the, the alt right. Um, and then there's this interesting one over here Adam Katzenelis's race event also um, created an entire community of, uh, there's a term called the human flesh search engine, which comes out of China. It's the idea is that if someone does something um, morally reprehensible, humans um, pull back, jump on to try and find out their identity, that person, where they live. Um, what they do, and you know, basically, like take them out through their kind of online vigilantes. Um, and in case of Cats of Venice, it, it was so big that it caused the Venice own community and now the religion. So that's the picture. And if I were to summarize what I just said, you have the mainstream media and politicians, a few party leaders, um, you've, you've got the South African left, basically, um, black nationalists and rent seekers, liberals. White right, both South, so local and international, they've really merged together, um, and the international left. That's kind of the state of play in terms of the groups involved in our, in our politics at this stage. Almost at the end of it, so the last thing I did was to look, okay, so again, where are the suspended users in this, in this picture? And um, I added a new thing to that as well. Not only we have suspended users, where the users who've changed their username, because those guys seem to be coming up quite a lot. So I don't mean me changing the display name that I to display in my Twitter account. I mean me changing the at handle. And arguably, if you change the display name, you know you might do that because you're, you're just thinking differently about yourself on a Wednesday to a Tuesday. Whereas if you change the, the at handle, you're basically giving yourself a new identity. And um, the kind of place where that idea of behavior may happen is if I am a bot wrangler or I own a lot of um, high quality accounts because there's a gradation of, of the quality of fake accounts. The older the account is, the more valuable it is because the more realistic it is. So if, um, if I am repurposing fake accounts for different projects as they've been hired out, I'm going to give them new names, new profile images, new biographies, I'm going to repurpose them for the current um, campaign. And um, so seeing where names are being changed on a regular basis is a potential flag that this is occurring. So here's the picture. The red are suspended, the green are name changed, and the blue, which you probably see, regularly uses to deactivate themselves. So what we're seeing is that there are three centers where suspended uses are occurring, like the suspicious behavior, maybe for just being racist, violent, and vitriolic. That is particularly the international alt-right, leading into the local far left, Radical economic transformation community and some parts of Black Twitter and the EFF. I still haven't figured out what this all means, but the name changes are heavily, heavily clustered in the 
around the mentioning communities. So what that's saying is potentially, you know, you, now I'm getting anecdotal and getting speculative, but you often hear about the journalists who are politicians complaining about trolls in their timeline. Those people are all sitting in this mainstream community. So potentially there's some kind of hit and run thing going on here where um, different users are, different accounts are being renamed and repurposed on a regular basis uh, in those mainstream ones. So um, in the echo chambers, you've got more um, suspended stuff going on. In the um, mainstream stuff, mainstream communities potentially have some more sustained things going on. But again, getting a bit speculative now, this is, you know, patterns in data. So that yeah, so that's that's where we stand. Um, whenever the international alt right comes in, so does interference, and they're coming in more and more. more. Um, the the radical economic transformers have clearly demonstrated that they don't mind using any tools to further their agenda. Um, and um, in my past research, I've looked at the EFF suspended accounts. They all look like South African accounts. So either they're high quality bots and fake accounts. Or they're just in the international market. So that's the state of play. That, that's, that's where we sit today going into the elections. That's the um, agendas, those are the, um, the narratives, the different narratives that are going to be pushed, and those are the different groups who are potentially willing to, to use underhanded means to, to get their narrative across. So now we're in 2019. What are those narratives going to focus on? Elections, obviously. Power, IPPs, Robin Gordon, a lot of racism events. Don't give undue um, oxygen to race, racism events. Because chances are you're just leading to uh, some kind of bigger strategy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, think twice before you, you, you just um, amplify what you take for um, legitimate um, ground swells on Twitter. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I just got a question about um, how you can visualize and explore those you know, data with all the users and those capacities. So, you give us very much a bird's eye view of what's going on. What about um, delving into that, sort of zooming in as you were a little bit, exploring those networks right now? So um, is that possible to have your software for that? Or is it possible? Well, I mean, these are just high, these are very high resolution images. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just I'm good to leaving out names more often than not. Um, but they're all there and um, just not stuff that I would usually put into a public article. But it's all there. Um, so, you know, once you've got a community, you, you, can, you can know what, what resonates with that community versus the next community. You can know who's leading the conversation. Yeah, so, so there's no sort of publicly available tool or way of diving into that. Not the moment. There are tools you can use to scan Twitter. Um, you get yourself there. You can get yourself a subscription to various commercial tools, which is that they are they're paying for sort of access to the data before they be like. Uh, but you can run a full scan on these. Uh, you can search on hashtag. So, so the phrase. Yeah, so so they've mentioned that the system was there's um, there's an the, the, the various ones back there. The, the challenge is going to be how much you pay for data. So, so yeah. there was a while ago, I was on a different platform where um, I could pull up, up to 200,000 weeks a month, but I was paying my son a few dollars a month for it. So, so you're, you're paying for data access. That would give you the full download and tell you exactly which accounts are. Most happy, which ones are most happy. So there's a good angle. This this a big uh push of the style of uh people that German on bottom to the cinema. You can get to the whole to the almost the whole to the fire on this time. Uh without getting uh what's the push off the right? That push of the bio. Um you can see also got a new code of files on the surface one. Yeah, they just figured out how the I use are uh, assigned and they're chronological and you need to figure out which service I use most. It's option. This question over here. Uh, this is kind of cutting the edge, I think. And maybe others can also tell us 
to what extent is this being tracked by like schools of journalism, media, media studies, and all that? Well, there's a community of people doing it, like yeah. and myself, and yeah. some yeah. others. But, um, but you're doing it almost like a commercial crusade, right? <laughs> oh, it's a strong word, hobby. Yeah. Okay, but I'm talking about students and yeah. like. How old are you from the university still in Russia? So, I don't think it's, uh, and uh, maybe uh, Michael back into that and Steve, but I don't think it's, this is taught anywhere yet. As Code for Africa, we have a contract with uh, Google News Lab, I think, and we, um, we give uh, training classes on this in 12 different African cities. We do it to three newsrooms in uh, each one of those cities, for example. So we're trying to push the, the, the training of that. We, that's why we were doing training yesterday for journalists, the SANF journalists, and we're going to be taking that to the other eight provinces and training for the SANF editors and journalists there. But it's, uh, it's like super, as you say, cutting edge stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, you might have some experience overseas as well. So, 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 so what we're seeing overseas is really simple. Yeah. There were a few places we were doing this before 2016. Particularly Oxford Internet Institute, um, and then 2016 happened, and the whole world went, "Oh my God, this is important." And, and what you're seeing now is the hobbyists are starting to get taken up to some press, some press, particularly in the US. So, and it's really been moving over the last 18 months. So, a lot of the journalism schools are now working up to the fact that this is really important, and they're desperately looking for people to do it. Um, there, there's a pro and a con. The, the pro is that there's there's tons of work out there that people do. Um, the con is that really if, you, if you're doing the teaching, you're not doing research, and there, there, are, there just aren't enough eyeballs on the screen at the moment. The great thing is some of the skills that they need to teach you. Like I've taught eight years, the long time to do what I do. So, so the, 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 some of the skills are relatively simple and easy to teach, uh, and you can teach kids because I have to talk kids. And so we're starting to see the trickle down effect. But it's, it's really, really early stage. I mean, 2016 was the big wake up call. Some of the big international universities are moving on it. Um, what you're going to see is more of a trickle down as more and more people do it. But at the moment, we're still in the, in the startup phase where there just aren't enough people who now do this. And so, I mean, just as one example, I'm going to try and keep an eye on, on the elections here. Simultaneously, I'll be keeping an eye on the elections in India and the EU. And that, that's just the way it works because there, there's not that many. So it's really about teaching people the first level of stuff that they can do themselves, and the university are then picking up those people and taking them on to train the next generation. The first challenge is to get data journalism in general, um, convincing and introduced into journalism schools, and they do touch on it. Um, so this would be probably a subset of that. Um, I graduated last year, and I can tell you the fact that we never did two classes on data journalism. And then I was still getting slides and like three things from the 90s when people were like, oh cool, you know this thing called the internet? And Where is this? You see, <laughs> literally I'm eating from the 90s. Shut up your ass, you're lying. I mean, I graduated in 2017 at Sea Beauty and we had a specific in one of our modules, you have to do data journalism and you have to learn how to do a massive open online course. But then again, I didn't have told us that he's going to do this for every class that comes through because the field and the industry is changing constantly. Even now, we have to do a course on algorithms and how to create the algorithm for news and to refine your search engines and stuff like that. And in fact, Code for Africa. Um, of course, we're for that this year for CPUT as well. What is the uh, UCT though? UCT. They should learn what the word algorithm means. Just I'll make it correctly. One more, two more, and we have to go on to It's not something, it's probably something that we talk about for a long time, but it's how you characterize this different classes and where you name them. They self identified, so when you talk about liberals and yeah, it's, 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 it seems like fire and arbitrary kind of character. So, so one of the things I'm, I'm looking at the class that I'm saying, who are the prominent individuals in there? 
and what is the content that is getting retweeted the most in there. And that gives me an idea of who's leading the conversation and what content is resonating. And then there's a bit of subject to it. It takes a while to come up with these names. I keep changing them because it's, yeah. tried, but it's very difficult to kind of portray them correctly. Yeah. I'll present, I'll present, I I'll present the slide of Kyle's to the IEC and more political bodies last week. And the only reason I survived is that I called up front. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> was, uh, the questions about the Navy were hidden. I said, I said, I did it. Uh, but it is a very relevant question. I mean, maybe it does a bit more about it. It's a lot of time. It's, it's challenging. One more track, and then let's see. So, I'm teaching the wrong ethics. So, this is like we've been in this mess. So it's been following, I mean, it's been going and escalating. But at the same time, and, and, and I think conversations really need to start by changing about the potential of social media. All we're hearing about is this dystopian kind of a hazard that is now escalating and is going to do us. At the exact same time in 2016, if the Democratic, is, the Democratic Party establishment had let Bernie Sanders do his thing, social media really gave him the American election at the same time, yeah. it was social media and youth engagement that gave the Labour Party the ability to, to, to create the biggest election turnaround in post war history. So there is, well, there is saying, so much potential. I you know, as long as it's all about board, as long as it's in the sunlight, let everyone have very good rights to choose for themselves. It's the underhanded subterfuge that pushes people in directions that they don't understand they're being pushed in. That leads to these abnormalities. And, and here's the thing: if, if you look at this in a historical context, so we're not going through anything that hasn't been gone through before. It's yeah. Not new. So I mean, the printing press. Yeah. It gets invented. People say, "Wow, it's the information revolution. We can suddenly print out the Greek classics, and everyone can read them. Everyone can read Greek, which is obviously the matter, right?" Um, <laughs> and then, you know, like 30 years later, you get the Reformation. Martin Luther comes along and says, "Wow, the printing press is my siege engine. These are my heavy artillery. I can print pamphlets against the Pope." And push them out everywhere. You get the <coughs> censorship, and you know Germany's broken into a thousand states. If 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 Hamburg bans the printing press, you just set up in Lübeck and keep on printing, right? And 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 there was this lengthy social debate over what the heck printing is. And what, you know, is it the information revolution? Is it the disinformation revolution? Is it saving humanity? Is it destroying humanity? And then you know, in a couple of generations, people say it's just printing. Why would you believe anything that's written? We're going through exactly that same moment now. It's just that because of the speed of the internet, it's massively complex. So, you know, we've had the, the thesis here is the information revolution. We're now in the antithesis is the disinformation revolution. Next comes the thesis. It's just going to be this is the way the world works now until the next revolution comes along. Cool. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Carl. Let's give a hand.
decide for yourselves how much you're going to believe. This is only my second time in South Africa. Um, I just flew down from, from Joburg now. Um, and I've got to say, there's many reasons to love this country. One of them is I've never seen any other country where you actually have a power button for the landscape. <laughs> so, this place is great. Right, so I'll be talking about election manipulation. There's lots of phrases out there. <coughs> election manipulation, election interference, foreign interference. I prefer talking about election manipulation. And the way I define it when I'm talking about it is an attempt to influence the election process by false, covert, or distorting, distorting activity. So it's messing around with the democratic process. The reason I prefer that phrase is because it can be external or internal. Right, in the US in 2016, there was all the external interference. In the UK, during the Brexit debate, it was all internal, pretty much. You think of the Gupta Holt, whole saga, external, internal, a bit of both, it gets complicated, right? So if you can put aside that question of, is it purely external or purely internal, just think about it as manipulation, and it avoids one very long and rather uncomfortable argument. It can be online or on the ground. I talk about the online stuff because I live up in Scotland and I'm online all the time, I can't do on the ground research here. But it's always worth bearing in mind, where do you have an on-the-ground component to what's happening on, online? And the difference from actual election campaigning is the false or the covert nature of the information or the assets. If party A runs an attack piece on party B and they get all their facts correct, that's politics. That's not election manipulation. It's if they're using false information or if they're using false assets to amplify, that's when you're getting into manipulation. So that's the way I think of this stuff. It's not actually that high tech. I've covered, in the last few years, I've covered the US election 2016, the French and German elections 2017, the Brazilian and Mexican elections 2018. So I've been looking at quite a lot of election stuff. The great majority of manipulation you see out there is not very high tech. It's not using deep fakes, it's using basic photoshops. It's not that smart, it's really unsubtle. Classic example, the Russian operation against the US, which started in 2014 and is still ongoing, and yes, it did happen. I read a lot of the 9 million tweets that came out of the Russian troll path, so if anybody's got doubts about that, we can talk about that to death afterwards. But they were buying American political adverts in Russian rubles. At the time, nobody noticed this. It's only afterwards that people started thinking that is surely a little bit dodgy. Um, so yeah, it's not that smart. Even the, the smartest operations are really good. What the Tennessee Republican Party was registered to a Russian mobile phone number. <laughs> Go think So here's the thing, it's possible to expose it once you're looking for it. Over the last three years, so many of the bad actors have benefited from the fact that nobody was looking out for it. Nobody was watching this kind of stuff online, and that has now changed. So actually, Elections are big and scary if you're only doing one every four or five years, but the kind of stuff that's going on online is normally pretty primitive, so it's worth keeping an eye out for, you can actually catch it. There's only a, a certain number of things that the bad actors can actually do, right? Either they're going to spread false claims, the Pope just endorsed Donald Trump, right? False claim. They will make a factual misstatement. Or they will be sharing false imagery. On election day, the classic thing to watch out for is people will just start posting online pictures of ballot box stuffing or voter fraud or irregularity and say, look, this just happened in Soweto this morning. Actually, it's something from Nigeria five years ago. That will always happen on election day, but it's, you know, it's reuse of images. Or there's going to be false amplification. It's the bots, it's the sock puppets, it's the, it's the light farms that get paid, right? So you're actually only looking for three things, false claims, false images or videos, and false amplification. False claims, that's what every journalist deals with every day. That's the fact chain. That's working out, is it true or false? So really what I'll be talking about is the false images and the false amplification, and how you can identify those and how we have identified those in the past. Is everybody happy with being told about that? If this is totally irrelevant to say so now, we can talk about something else. Everyone good? Okay. You're not alone. It feels like it when you're in your own country and the elections are coming up, you're thinking, oh my God, this is terrifying. But actually, every democracy in the world is struggling with the same problems. I have been interviewed in so many different countries, and it's always the same questions coming up. What do we do about this? How do you handle it? We're all in the same boat. 
I'll leave my contact details at the end. If you've got questions, just ping me afterwards. I already had a break. So, so keep in touch. You're not alone. Everyone is dealing with the same problems. There's a lot of expertise out there. You know your own patch best. You know what is incongruous. You know what makes sense in local context. You know what doesn't make sense in local context. And that is super important because the place all of this stuff starts is you start by looking for stuff that just doesn't make sense. It's as simple as that. You see something online and you think, hang on, that does not make sense. A couple of examples. So, end of 2017, I thought I would do a bit of a scan of uh, Twitter in South Africa around the AMC, the, the, the Zuma, um, Flamini Zuma Ramaphosa um, election rate. And so I pulled pages after pages of, of Twitter to look at what people were saying about CR17 and Flamini Zuma and NDZ. And I searched for various hashtags. And this is kind of a typical page I came out with. And, you know, sorry for being foreign, but, but you, know, you look down here and the names kind of look South African and the identities look kind of, kind of look South African. You've got a mix of languages, you've got a mix of cultures. But you, you look at that and you think, yeah, these are posting about South, South African Twitter. The accounts look like they're South African. Nothing to see here. Everyone agree with that? And then I came across this page, which is all retweeting Adam TV, <laughs> condemning remarks by President by, by, um, by Ramaphosa. And you've got Vets Helping Heroes, you've got Lizzie and Skater Chick and Woody Smoke. And you know, I've looked around 100 pages of, of, of various sorts of Afrikaans and Zulu names, and I'm suddenly seeing this. And I'm just thinking, now, this, this, this does not make sense. Put your hands up if you think that does not make sense for the South African political yeah. context. Yeah? It's, it's, that's where you start. And so then I thought, right, so I'm going to look at some of the individual accounts which are posting on, on this particular retweet. And these are the ones I came up by a while, I'll recognize them. Right? So, these are all retweeting South African political content. You've got Megan in Philadelphia. You've got Starrett City Boxing. I worked out that's in Brooklyn. You've got Michigan. You've got Oklahoma. You've got Texas. What in the world is going on here? And I was going through this with my daughter, who, who at that stage was about nine years old. And she said, Betty, have you looked at their usernames? That should be an I, but it's actually an L in that name, Ben Kine. I thought, yeah, so what happens if we replace the L with an I? You get that. These are all original Twitter accounts. These are all bots, where in each case the username is one character different from the real one. If somebody's gone to the hassle of taking you know, the username, the, the handle, the profile picture, and cloning them. So, for example, here you've got Ashton de Caro on the left, Ashton de Caro with, a, with an O at the end of it, and on the right, Ashton de Caro with a zero. So what we've got here is a network of very high quality bots, which have been set up to mimic real people. <coughs> Somebody's put a lot of time into creating these, and then they've gone and used them to retweet South African political content from their Midwestern American accounts. Yeah. So it started off just looking at that one page of, of, of tweets and thinking that that doesn't add up, and it led to the identification of this bot. That's the kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that, that you can find. There's another example, which was a fun one. This was from the German election in September 2017. Um, this is an election ad from the IFD party, the Alternative for Germany, which is the, the anti-migrant party in Germany. Uh, the the captain's vice Silvester is, uh, do you remember New Year? And it's referencing the, the sex attacks by migrants on German women in Cologne. New Year's Eve 2016 17, I think. 16, 16, 17. Um, but again, and, and this was running two days before the election on Facebook. And a colleague and I looked at this and thought, something does not add up with this picture. If you look at the lighting, particularly under her chin, you see how sharp that shadow is? You compare that with the lighting of the people behind her. It's like, unless this girl is standing in front of somebody with a damn great TV camera like that in her face, that looks photoshopped. Everyone agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So, so we thought, right, that looks photoshopped. Can we find the original? And so we thought we'd run a reverse search on it. I'll show you. Does everyone know how to reverse search? Yeah. So we ran a reverse search. And we found that. Check out the faces in the background. Yeah. It's the identical shot. 
This is meant to be for low at New Year 2016. This is Lara Logan on Tahrir Square in Cairo in 2011. And all they've done is they photoshopped the head in. So we thought, right, we've got a story here. A political party in Germany is running a Photoshop ad three days out from the election. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could find the original of that picture so we could show where did this come from? Reverse search didn't show it. So what do you do? You crowdsource. We actually posted, my colleague posted, we're trying to find out who the person in this photo is. Can you help? And within about an hour, we have the URL. Somebody likes a blonde and just knew where that was. <laughs> so we checked the URL, and sure enough, there's the picture. Now, we didn't, we reverse searched that one again, we didn't get a match, but then we flipped it. And lo and behold, the Spanish language edition of For Him magazine, the Lads magazine, right? So you put all that together, you've got a blank <coughs> on a 2011 incident being used three days out from the election. And then somebody else saw our crowdsource thing and said, incidentally, have you seen this? Now this is a white supremacist post. And look at the image again. And this was from a couple of years before, it's 2015. It's all about the white European genocide, yeah, and the, Jew the, the Jewish subversion of Europe. So the ultimate source for the political ant campaign was a white supremacist anti-Semitic site. We did an article on that two days before the election. We were the front page on the biggest tabloid in Germany the day before the election. Because we were able to demonstrate not just that the IFA was running a Photoshop image, but where all the different pieces had come from. The IFA said, oh, we just got it from somebody who's applied it. A lot of like, yeah. So that's some of the stuff you can do. It's, you know, that's not a complicated trick that they play. It's just that you need to be looking for it. So the weird things you're looking for on platforms are going to be images, videos, and amplification. So I'll tell you a little bit about the tools we use on our team to look at each one of those. Okay. Images, first of all, does everyone does anybody here not know how to do reverse search? We're all going on reverse searches. Okay. Do you guys know the tool RevI? Okay, so uh, do you know photo forensics? Photo forensics is a useful one uh, because it will actually, if you, there's two ways it can work. Either you download the picture and upload it, or else you insert the image URL. But what it will give you is, among other things, an error level analysis of the image that you're looking at. This is a profile picture which has not been manipulated, and you're, you're not getting much color variation between the different bits, right? But it's, this, is an, this is an online free service. What you're looking for, if an image has been photoshopped, you'll get these sudden heat spots like that, and that, and that. So what you can do is, if you're looking at an image online and you want to check whether it's been photoshopped, you run it through photo forensic and you look for telltales like that. So it's a neat way, right at the start. It's, it's not the most bulletproof system, so if you think you have found something photoshopped, you need to then triangulate on it, you need to try and find the original you might want to try and use some, some proprietary software to do a bit more rigorous analysis. But as a place to start, it's a good way of looking for edited imagery. So you're looking for those. It'll also give you the full metadata. Sometimes that will be obvious if you're trying to find it. If it's got a GPS location in there, it's got a timing in there. It varies from image to image what you'll find. But again, using photo forensics, you can do an analysis on the image itself. There's times when that's useful. You all know about reverse searching. I tend to use Google Chrome because it's built in. And then the thing I love about Google is you've actually got the various tools. So you've got the time settings, you can filter by search, you can filter by date. Very, very useful if you're trying to prove that yeah, on election day, if you've got that photo of ballot box stuff in, you do a time search on Google for that photo and you prove actually that was posted five years ago. Revi, note that name there. It's a Chrome extension, so you download it, you build it into Google Chrome. What that will then do is you can run a search. You get a little icon up at the top right. Right click and you get the reverse image search option. 
But sorry guys. But what you'll get, it'll run simultaneous searches on Google, Bing, Yandex, Tinai, and Byte. So if you want to save yourself time, do that. The one thing to bear in mind is when you do that, it'll open up five new um, browser tabs simultaneously. So depending, depending how many tabs you've already got open, you might want to be closing some before you do that. Otherwise, you just you sprawl too much. But it's a really, really neat way just to get through all five at once. Do you guys know the Amnesty Video Checker? Okay, so again, on election day, as well as getting photos going around saying, uh, you know, here's ballot box stuffing or here's a photo for you get videos doing the same thing. With the Amnesty site, what you do is you enter, let, let's say somebody say, look, the police are beating up voters or beating up demonstrators or whatever. You get the YouTube URL there and you paste it into the data viewer. And what it does, rather than checking the full video, it will pull out the thumbnails of the video, it will pull out individual frames from the video, and it'll give you the option to reverse search each one over there. Yeah? And so you click on that, and you'll then get a Google reverse search, which will show you other videos which have got the same thumbnails. Now, in this case, this was an original video, so there weren't many results. But what you'll find is that if it's a video that's been run many times before, that will show up through the reverse search. So the Amnesty tool, should, should I put the URL back up? Have you all got it? Have you all got it? Yeah, okay, so, so the Amnesty tool is a really good way of checking that. There's also one called boingboing.net. Nothing to do with Silvio Berlusconi. Um, again, you insert, yeah, you put the YouTube URL in, and again, it will pull out the thumbnails and then you can reverse search them. So, so both of those are tools where you can look at a video and you check where else it's being used. Amplification. How many of you guys work regularly on bot spotting and troll spotting and soft products and that kind of thing? Anybody okay. else? Okay, keep going. Great. So bots, light farms, and flash bombs. Basically, there are three different ways that small groups will try and make those look like large groups. Um, they'll either use bots, which are automated accounts that you program where you buy, they amplify you. If you're on Facebook or Instagram, you'll see them buying in likes from other countries. Or you'll just get small groups who will organize, and then it'll be a group of maybe, maybe 15 or 20 people, but they'll all be posting like crazy for half an hour, and they'll create so much volume so fast, it'll look like a trend. And once it gets picked up by the trending algorithm, real people will actually start to see it make them. So very basically, what you're looking for is bots, light farms, and flash mobs. Now, if, there, if you've got any kind of access to the, to the numbers of Twitter, uh, or if you have my email address and you want to ask me if there's a particular flow you're interested in, if you think about it, if a small group is trying to look large, there's only a few ways it can actually do it. Either the small group posts a load of tweets each, or they post a few, but then they get loads of bots to retweet them, so it generates that volume of traffic. Or they just get loads and loads of retweets from bots and cyborgs. Cyborgs are semi-automated accounts. Or they actually prepare a load of bots in advance, and they get them to post um, stuff from an Excel spreadsheet that they've already created. Those are the main techniques that they will use, unless it's a really super sophisticated actor. But that means if they've only got those different methods you can use, all of those are going to lose a tra you leave a trace in the numbers that you're looking at. So if you see a high average number of tweets per user, so let's let's say normally on a on a on an organic flow of Twitter traffic, if you do the maths, any search tool you use will show you how many tweets in total and how many users it came from. You just divide the number of tweets by the number of users. On a normal organic flow, you're probably talking between 1.1 and 2.2 tweets per user, very, very roughly. If you see a flow where you're talking 50 tweets per user, then you can guarantee somebody is trying to gain that hashtag. I saw that two days ago in India. 50 tweets per user is insane out of 50,000 tweets. So if you see a high average number of tweets per user, you suspect somebody is trying to gain that algorithm. If you see a high proportion of activity from a small number of accounts, again, the, the, the Indian flow I was looking at the other day, you had 50,000 tweets in total. Of those 50,000 tweets, 30,000 came from just 50 accounts. 
it's insane. But you, know, you look at those 50 accounts, and they're, they're each, you know, if you just look at them, you think, right, that's a small group which is trying to gain the traffic and make it look big. Yeah. So it's a very simple numerical indicator. Or if there's a high proportion of reads, because right, much, most of the tools you can get online, and we can talk about tools at the end, uh, will tell you what proportion of the traffic is read reads. Normally, anything up to about 70%, 75% would fit with organic traffic. Um, if it's beyond that, you start thinking, okay, it looks like somebody bought a load of bots to read it. I'll give you three examples. So, in Mexico, in last summer, um, there was a guy who was bragging about being the king of fake news in Mexico. And he actually did an interview with a journalist, and he made this hashtag, none of them victory lab, win with victory lab. He made a trend on Twitter. I ran the analytics on that hashtag, and it turned out it had 2,723 mentions, but it only came from 202 users. So we're talking an average of 13.5 tweets per user. There's no way that's organic traffic. So if all you see are the numbers there, that's enough to tell you that's not organic traffic, and then you want to start looking at what the traffic is. Why, why is it so different? What, you know, what's driving it? Does it look like bots or users? But just seeing those numbers there, that's your early warning of somebody who's gaming. Another example, Marine de Vigny said, so before the French election in May 2017, there was a very, very active French group of far-right activists who were pushing uh, hashtags supporting Marine Le Pen, the far-right candidate. And regularly in the space of an hour and a half, they could get 45,000 tweets going on their hashtags. They were really, really impressive with what they did. But again, I did the rundown of the numbers. This is what Marine de Vigny said was one of their posts, uh, one of their hashtags. They got 24,000 posts in total. And they ran between 4 p.m. and midnight. So it's basically eight, eight hours. Most of the traffic was in the first two hours. But looking at the numbers, this guy here, Pat Theologa, posted 317 tweets in that scan. Mr. Jumperotu posted 301. La Roche Jacques, 289. So these are, and this is all in an eight-hour period, right? And again, most of it was the first two hours. So you're talking 150 tweets an hour, that's two and a half tweets a minute. There's no way that is normal human behavior. Um, and if you added up the 50 most active accounts, they created about 40% of all the traffic. This was a mixture of bots and semi-automated accounts, but just looking at those numbers is enough to tell you so much traffic is coming from such a small group, somebody is trying to game the system. So again, it's, it's a numbers game. And the final one I looked at was unfollowing enemies, enemies of the nation, which is translated from Arabic by a researcher who speaks Arabic. Um, but this was after the Jamal Khashoggi murder. And we know from, from Twitter that, that after the murder, there was an enormous sort of pro-Saudi sentiment online. And then Twitter went and culled thousands and thousands of bots. I ran the numbers on this particular hashtag. And one of the things the tool I use tells you is what proportion of retweets it was. So that's your proportion of retweets, that red bar there. 96.3% of all mentions were pure retweets with no added comment. That is off the charts. You just look at that number and you say, right, somebody's turned on a batch of retweet bots there. Normally with retweet proportions, you're talking up to 70%, maybe 75%, over 90%, somebody's turned on a bot. So these are tricks you can use with the numbers if you've got any kind of data access. All you need to do is look at that and think, right, go find the bot then, because it's going to be in there somewhere. Facebook and Instagram, you face a different set of challenges. Okay? The great thing with Twitter is that you can pull all the data. You can actually look at the full numbers and the full scans and everything. Facebook and Instagram are much more restrictive on privacy and what you can see. So what you need to be doing is much more eyeball checking. And I'll show you a case study, uh, all of which was done by eyeball. I'm not going to name this account because we're still investigating exactly how this works. Um, but this is from an African user who's posting about investments on Facebook. The interesting thing, he's got 561,000 reactions, more than half a million reactions on that post. That's pretty massive. If you look at them up here, 552,000 of those are thumbs up. You've got about 6,500 hearts. If the proportion, you've got almost 100 times more thumbs up than anything else. That's a really weird proportion to be having. You'll get more likes than, than, than other things normally, but not, not 100 times more. So that's an initial little warning that there's something worth looking at here. And then you look 
at some of the accounts which are actually doing the like. You just click on the likes, and suddenly you're seeing accounts like Maud Mushkan and Ashalina Khalifa and Khamza Madrid, Basit Nabi. And you look down these accounts and you find guys like this, who's apparently a cricket, sorry. He's apparently a cricket fan in Pakistan. And looking down the list, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those likes by an eyeball were from young male users in Pakistan. Why are young male users in Pakistan mass liking an African post about investment in Africa? There's something dodgy there. You all agree that's, that seems a little unusual. And what that looks like is a, a like farm. So, so you'll get people who will either create false accounts or will simply co opt false accounts. They'll get hold of the passwords of loads of accounts in a particular country and they'll start using them to sell likes. And you can sell likes online for. I mean, there, there was a, a like network I found a year ago which was selling 10,000 likes for $60. So it's a really, really cheap market. But what that looks like, if, if you have tons and tons of likes from people who just, you don't see why they would be interested in that particular post, start suspecting that there's some kind of commercialization going on. Does that make sense? In the same way on Instagram, again, we're still investigating this one, um, but notice the pink. Right, we're looking at a very, very pink post here, and it's about a, um, a basically a pop up cosmetics parlor in China. Look at all the guys who are liking it. Like the word guys here. Why are these guys liking a pink pop up cosmetics parlor? And again, this post had about 1,000 and something likes. Almost all of them were from young male users in, in South Asia, many of whom appear to be most like. Why are they liking that post? One or two, maybe they've got a secret life they don't want their friends to know about. But to have hundreds of those, again, that's where you start thinking, this looks like somebody bought amplification for that post. If, if, again, if it doesn't make sense, that, then there's a reason why it won't make sense. Does this make sense? Great. Yet another one, um, and this was again the Mexican election in last summer. So the, the headline here reads, the millionaire businessman behind the fake news sites in Mexico. And we were keeping an eye on the Mexican election, and something we kept on seeing is this, this same guy who ran a company called Victory Lab kept on doing weird interviews with the Spanish-speaking press. He was on CNN in Espanol, he was on Univision, he, uh, Univision. he was in, in El País, in Spain, right? He was an international star as the king of fake news in Mexico. And what he was saying was, yeah, I'm the king of fake news, I can make anybody trend. And I will, you know, I'm charging politicians a million bucks a month to make them trend and to get their names trending and to get their hashtags trending. And I was just reading this stuff and thinking, surely if you are actually the king of fake news, the last thing you're going to do is post about it. You're going to shut up and run your operation. So, so something about this just did not add up. And so I thought, right, what are we going to do? Let's have a look at his amplification. He was boasting about all the secret Facebook pages that he ran. We didn't know what they were, but his company had a Facebook page. So we thought we'd look at that. And the Facebook page was full of things like this. This is, yeah, again, yeah, hey, read the interview with our boss about being the king of fake news. But if you, when we looked at it, this had 2,800 likes. Okay. First weird thing, it didn't have any other sort of reaction at all. Where are the hearts? Where are the smiling faces? This was after Facebook added in hearts and smiling faces. Also, wouldn't they be an encouragement comment? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are the comments, right? If, if it's a genuine popular tweet, you'll get people, sorry, a post, you'll get people commenting on it. So, what you've got here, straight away, you're thinking, so we've got 2,800 likes. And no other reactions at all. That screams paid engagement. People have been paid to go and like it, and so they go and like it. But they're not doing any of the other sort. All these real people. What is the automation thing? Uh, <laughs> there are. It looks like there were various degrees of falsified or compromised accounts. On Facebook is quite hard to tell because you don't get the same amount of data. Um, some of the accounts look, look like they have been created by a genuine person and then maybe abandoned for a while and then came back. Uh, some look like they might, some have taken profile pictures from real people and reused them. But so 
is there is there some kind of automation during the life or behind the hundred? Is there always a real person taking life? Do you know? Uh, we think there probably isn't, but we'll get onto that in a minute. That there's there's some kind of control mechanism. <coughs> it looks like it goes from case to case. Sometimes it's a lot of individual users who are running like 10 or 15 accounts each. Sometimes it looks like somebody has just managed to automate to some degree. Um, but you, without actually seeing what's going on behind the account, it's hard to tell. Um, but what the other thing we noticed was that a lot of these accounts had Portuguese Brazilian names and had and claimed Portuguese Brazilian identities. And so we're thinking, why are hundreds and hundreds of Brazilians suddenly liking a Mexican Spanish post about Mexican politics? Again, it does not add up. So we started looking at some of these Facebook accounts, and all this was done by eyeball. None of this was automated. Um, and we found accounts like this. The key thing here, lots and lots of these accounts had these letters PCSD, so either on the banner or as the place of work or somewhere in the bio. We didn't know what PCSD was, but we thought it's such a common thread running through it that we're going to have a look. And what we found was a group where people were posting things like this. That is a Brazilian bank statement. Bank receipt. There is the user saying, yep, sale of a page for dollars. PCSD was a group who made their business selling likes, pages, and followers. And, the, and these are the guys who were selling 10,000 Instagram, Instagram likes for super bucks, right? But they were actually showing their bank details to the group as a measure of transparency, right? We charge you the money, we take the money, we put it in the collector. So, so PCSD, this whole thing was just a commercial operation making money out of, of being on Facebook. And these are the guys who are amplifying victory lap. And so we're looking at this Mexican king of fake news and we're thinking, okay, so the guy who's bragging about charging people a million bucks a month to make the trend, somebody is buying all the amplification for his Facebook page from Brazil at the rate of 10,000 likes for 60 bucks. He's making a hell of a profit there. But king of fake news, not so much. So then we thought, well, let's have a look at the Twitter, Twitter feed, because Victory Lab had a Twitter feed as well, right? 34,000 followers, it's a good number. Mexican company, posting about their leaders' interviews in Spanish. So why are their followers from Indonesia? We asked ourselves. And so we looked at some of these accounts that were doing the following. We came out with words like this. Uh, I think that's Korean, but don't correct me if I'm wrong. Um, look at the weird mixture of accounts that it's following. Quotes and sayings, one of the Asian languages. Have a risk with rugby club, right? And then the, the real thing, look here, at how many accounts it's following. It's tweeted four times and it's following up 5,000 accounts. That is a follower bot. That is an account which is set up in order to follow loads of other accounts, and that is automated. And follower bots exist in the thousands, and they will certainly lose somebody's follower. So that's a commercial operation. So basically, we worked out that, that this, this king of fake news in Mexico was a fake. It, all he was doing was outsourcing. He was buying amplification, or amplification was being bought for his company on Twitter and Facebook from East Asian bot farms and from Brazilian mining. And on that basis, he was then getting other people to trend. So he was reselling online content, and that's all there was to it. We reported on this. My team had a partnership with Facebook, so we passed our findings on to Facebook. They went and had a look at the stuff behind the scenes, which we never get to see, and they discovered one of the biggest fake engagement operations they have ever found in Brazil, and they took it all down a month before the election. So all that potential to buy engagement on Portuguese Facebook was taken out a month before the election. And all this was done by my book. None of this was automated. So it's, again, it's just making the point, you don't have to have big data feeds in order to do this. You need to look for what's weird. Do you think it's worth South Africans and crowdsourcing take down investigation like this for our elections? Absolutely. To try and keep, keep up the streets before that. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the slight caveat depends what you're going to be going for. But botnets are so easy to replace. But unless it's a very high value botnet where they've all been given individual, you know, if they, they've been made to look local and you can identify as a botnet, absolutely get it taken down. Um, if you find like farms, they're more pernicious because there's human users behind them, but it'll take human users a long time to spin up a, a, a genuine looking account. 
So, so yeah, the, the more you can try and, I mean, A, map and then B, clean up the space before the election, the better chance you have of, of having a cleaner election. I mean, one of the interesting examples is the Russian troll fund, right? So, um, through 2016, they were operating in China, basically entirely unhindered. Um, the platforms caught up with them the second half of 2017. And they took down 58,000 Twitter accounts, I think, with about 50,000 of the bots and the rest were run by people. Um, several thousand Facebook and Instagram pages, and there have been successive takedowns since then, you know, a few hundred pages here, and you know, a couple hundred like that accounts there. The amount of activity that was coming out from the Russian troll farm that we know of just before the midterms was way, way, way down. Because you, you, can, you can spin up a botnet easily, but actually getting anybody to follow it takes time. Getting real human engagement is hard work. And some of the accounts that the troll farm lost had like 150,000 followers, many of whom were genuine, many were not, but it looks like sort of between 90 and 100,000 were real followers. If you lose that following and you create a new account, you've got two options. Either you say, hey, this is the new account of Russian troll number one, at which point Twitter goes, thank you, it isn't anymore, you're not. Or else you have to start from scratch and you have to start building your audience again. So the more you can disrupt the bad actors online, the more chance you're giving to an actual real conversation to happen. I'd say in the local context, some of the ones to focus on are the anonymous influencers. There are certain anonymous influencers in the local context, like 15,000, 100,000, and they are the ones spouting particular vitriol and stuff like that. You know, it's like the classic one is the activist, which was mm -hmm. you know, a, a Russian controlled account that had all the legitimacy and Follow the numbers. Yeah. Um, if you look at most of the communities on Twitter, we, 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 almost all the communities, we know who the real people are that are leading them. There's just one or two where we don't have those ones that we focus on trying to find out who those people are. More questions at this point? Another thing you can look for when you're looking at networks is on Facebook, particularly, you can look for who. Whether, if, if there are some pages you're not sure about, sometimes you can actually see <coughs> some of the administrators for those pages because they, they don't like, they don't always like them. And that's a good way of building out a little network. And there's a case study we worked on earlier this year where there was a set of pages across the, the former Soviet Union, all of which were amplifying Sputnik, which is the, the Kremlin propaganda, one of the Kremlin propaganda channels. Um, and this, this one at the top here, it's meant to be a fashion case. It's all about fashion in Georgia, that's what the, the, the name means. But all it's doing, all these shares her here, are Sputnik Georgia, every single time. That was all it was sharing. Um, and there were other ones which were not just sharing, but actually reposting, cross-posting Sputnik videos. That one at the bottom right is Sputnik, so you can see why they posted. But these ones here, this is meant to be a travel page, travel in Georgia. This one is uh, Georgian uh, spas and resorts, right? And there was a network of pages, and we thought, what's going on here? 90% of what they're doing is amplifying stuff. They look like Sputnik amplifiers. That's what they've been set up to do, but they're claiming to be independent. So let's have a look at the pages and see what we can find out. Most of them, and, and yeah, this one, the, the Fashion in Georgia page, it was even sponsoring a Sputnik Georgia post. So the Fashion in Georgia page, which was meant to be independent, was paying to advertise Sputnik in Georgia, which is pretty weird, right? So again, you look at that and you think, this doesn't add up. We looked at the pages, and we found this one uh, to be uh, to be see how addicted to you. But actually, unusually on this page, if you go to the about section, it actually had an admin. It named an account called Lana Folly. So we went and looked at that account. And the nice thing about Facebook is that if somebody is managing pages, actually on their profile page, it will tell you down here, what page was they managing? If you click on that bit, you get the full list. And here in the middle is our Fashion in Georgia page, right? The one that was paying to add to my Sputnik. So we thought at this point, right, either this is somebody who's a real fan of Sputnik and is just pushing it through different channels, or it's a totally fake account, which is being run for the benefit of Sputnik. So we wanted to work out which one is it. Is it a genuine enthusiast? So what do you do if you've got a reverse, if, if you've just given it away, have not you? You reverse search, okay? So we looked at this beautiful young lady's profile, um, the hard part of her, and she had three profile pictures that she had posted during the fairly short life of the account. Can't see the face in that one. This is the only one where you can see the face, yeah. 
So three profile pictures, only one could be identified as a human being anyway. But when you reverse search these images, here's the first one, right? It's actually a Google Plus profile picture from March 2015. Okay, so that's not a real person. Then you get this one. It's actually cropped up on Pinterest. And it was published there in July 2017, and that was actually from a French language website talking about different ways you can interpret hair. And then this one is the only one where you actually see any kind of face at all. Again, it's a hairstyle page. And it usefully identifies the source, which is a Swedish Instagram model. So this page, which only had, for its account, which only had three profile pictures, had taken all of them from different places online. So at that point, we were comfortable saying, this is a fake page. And one of the rules on Facebook is that authenticity counts. You have to be the person you're not claiming to be. If you're using three different profile pictures and they've all been taken from different places, inauthentic. Facebook then dug into this whole network and they actually found, looking at the, at the hidden admins, the ones who weren't shown on the pages themselves, that actually most of them were splitting employees. This whole network of, of pages was being run by employees of Sputnik itself. So it was a covert amplification effort by the Russian propaganda channel because it wasn't getting enough to cover those countries. But again, it's just it's, you're looking for something incongruous, and if you can find one admin, sometimes you can actually build out. So, last story. You don't always know what you're gonna find until you found it. And that's really, really important. A lot of the work we do is, is almost routine monitoring, it's taking the temperature and just trying to identify who the main actors are, who the big voices are. And a lot of it is just knowledge that you pigeonhole and then you leave and maybe it's gonna be used later. So while we were studying the French election, we came across this guy, his, his Twitter handle is Mess. Yeah, with three S's in the middle of it. Um, this is one of the leaders of that Pro Le Pen group I talked about, who made like 45,000 tweets go out in an hour and a half. Okay? We did an article on this, on this group because they were so skillful and so very, very good at what they did. Um, and then, then we left it because we were working on other things, right? But, but just remember, remember the name Messner. Completely separately, we were looking at Russian influence in the US. 2017, there was a lot of that going on. We came across this guy. You might know the name Jack Posobiec. So Jack Posobiec is a, he describes himself as, a, as the Slav right. So he's a Slav chauvinist slash white supremacist, leading voice on the alt right. What was interesting was he was posting about his summer campaign reading, and the book is The uh, Principles of Geopolitics by Alexander Putin, who is the architect of the concept of Eurasianism, and he's Vladimir Putin's favorite philosopher. So, <coughs> We saw that, we thought that, that's pretty weird. We didn't do a story on it in the end. We just thought that's that's bizarre. Okay, well, whatever. But again, just remember the name. And then separately again, we came across a US alt-right site called Disobedient News, which, which claims to be independent journalism telling you the news that mainstream media ignore. Right, we've heard this before. Um, very much a disinformation and misinformation outlet. And the stuff they were doing was so weird that it was getting amplified so bizarrely that we did a story on that. It's about, I mean, this was being spread on Reddit a lot. Reddit was really cropping up as a portal where this kind of story was going around. So we did a story about the amplification of this on Reddit. And then again, we moved on. Okay? At this point, these were three completely separate data points. We had no idea that there was anything going to come of this. And then came May and the Macron leaks. Okay? So on the in, in the first week of May, France goes to the polls to elect their new president. And by this time, it's a two horse race. It's Emmanuel Macron, who's a centrist, and it's Marine Le Pen, who's the far right candidate. Okay? We knew the Macron campaign had been hacked because they had confirmed it themselves. We knew that loads of emails had gone missing. The whole of the week before the second round of voting, all the journalists, all the data scientists were kind of on their tippers going, When's the leak going to come? And it didn't come. Friday night, I thought, it's not going to come now. I'm going to bed. An hour later, the phone went off, and it was Reuters saying, hey, have you seen Macron leaks just started trending? I said, no, I hadn't seen that, but thank you for waking me up, but I will go and look, okay? And what had happened was somebody had dumped on Pastebin nine gig of data from the Macron campaign 36 hours before the polls opened, and it was trending massively on Twitter under the hashtag Macron leaks. May 5th, 2017, 
That's the timeline of the posts on my colleagues. 46,000 tweets in three hours. It's quite a high volume, it's not massive by any means, but I started running the data scans, and I, the, the program I was using at that time, one of the things we'll do on the first page, it will show you how many users, how many posts, these are the users who get mentioned most, these are the users who get retweeted most, and these are the tweets that get retweeted most. Yeah, so you get all of this stuff in the dashboard. So I run the software on my colleagues, I pull up the dashboard, and one of the things I see, the top 50 accounts getting mentioned. I saw the first four and it was a hallelujah moment. Because the top four, number one is WikiLeaks. Well, I think we've all heard of WikiLeaks, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Number two, oh wait, Jack of Soviets. That's that Slav right guy who reads Dukin, remember? Number three, Messmer. Well, hang on. That's the French guy who advertised my name. Yeah. News. Well, hang on, that's the bizarre disinfo site in the US, right? So, as soon as I looked at that, I thought, blimey, I know who those four accounts are straight off. I know what they are, written on them before. And that immediately tells you that the transmission of Macron leaks is going via WikiLeaks, the alt right in the US, and the far right in France. So, you immediately know, right, this is where this story is moving. So then the, quick, the big question is, where did it start? And again, the nice thing with any kind of software that you run on Twitter particularly is that you, you, know, you download all the, all the data and you go to the first page and you will actually find the first tweets. And in this case, that was the first tweet of my colleagues. It's Jack the Soviets. And look at the time. That was 7.49 p.m. on the 5th of May. Okay. Then, at 8.31 p.m., so like 40 minutes later, WikiLeaks jumped in. And it's really weird, isn't it, that WikiLeaks is jumping in and saying, look, there's really loads of stuff online. We don't know if it's genuine or not, but we thought we'd tell you about it anyway. I'm sure that was an innocent decision on that. But that's 40 minutes later, right? And then, Messner jumps in, hey, alert, WikiLeaks has just published all these documents. And his time is 9.32, so it's an hour later. So what we've got here, is not just we know which worlds this is moving in, but we know this stunted in the alt right in America, the Twitter traffic. We don't know where the leaks came from at this point, but the Twitter traffic started with the alt right in America, then it got amplified by WikiLeaks, and only then did it come to France. So, what's the story here? The story here is not there are leaks in America. The story is the far right in the US is interfering in the French election, and here's the proof, and you have the timeline, and you have the tweets minute by minute to prove it. So I pick up the phone and go back to Reuters and say, yes, I think there is something I can tell you about my colleagues. This was a, the Reuters story overnight. We're in the same news cycle. This is Friday night going into Saturday, so we're still 28 hours out from the cold opening. This is the Monde in France on the, this was on the Saturday. Who is the pro-Trump activist who has amplified Macron's? This is the New York Times, right? This is all happening before the polls have opened. This is the same news cycle. And so what could have been a story on the scandal about emails from Macron campaign was a story about far right in America tries to talk you to a French election at the last minute. And that really, I spent that entire week on, weekend on the phone doing interviews. Because that was the story. And bear in mind at that point, it was six months after the Trump election, right? So, so hacking, leaking, Russian interference, far like I want really, really big news stories anyway. You put them together, it was a massive story. But it, I mean, it was, it was by the grace of God. We spent time analysing the networks beforehand. We knew who these accounts were, and it really was. It was that hallelujah moment. I just looked up on that, that dashboard, that first page, and I knew who all the actors were. So then it was just a question of finding out which one of them actually did it first. And it really is that important to know your own brand, your own actors, because that's when, when something starts moving. Somebody asked me a while back, why didn't the Soviets do it from an anonymous account? It's like, because anonymous accounts don't have any followers. If you can tweet from an account that nobody knows about, but nobody's going to see it. If you're going to make a noise, you're going to make enough noise to interfere in an election, you've got to do it from an account which has lots of followers and they're not that many. So it's so important to identify who are the main voices, who are pushing these stories out there, where's the amplification coming from, because that tells you the story, not just of what is happening, but why it's happening. 
So just to sum up, it's not that high tech. It's tweets, it's photoshops. It's not that smart. There are still people buying adverts rules. And it is possible to explode, expose when you are looking for it. Look for the false claims. Look for the false images. Look for the false amplification. Because you're not alone. I'll give you my email address at the end. If you want to get in touch, get in touch. You know your own patch address. So thank you very much. This kind of information is it, is it somewhere available as a credit uh, comment that can be used for teaching, or where can we access some of this some of this information? Uh, the actual slide deck or the stories are based on this, this, uh, the slide deck, or because that you put it you put it down so beautifully. Where can we access this kind of stuff? Um, so a, a lot of the stories are out are, are online. I, I can put together a, a file of, of the links where the stories are. Um, I prefer not start sharing my slide decks, but, but, but yeah, it, I mean, this is all. It, apart from the like files, which we're still investigating, everything else is still it is already published. So I can put together the, the, the links and the stories, and you're more than well. All the screenshots there are from stuff we've already published. Yeah, I think we we'll might some teaching material um, at um, Code Academy, which you can uh, let you share. There's also great stuff in Africa, check a bunch of other places. Yeah, maybe we should get a um, page of useful links. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, the emphasis has been very much on amplification and, and like the public media and to the masses, etc. There's also a lot of stuff going on that's very targeted, using a little bit more maybe technological, using a lot of databases to 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 direct like different adverts to different people on the basis of their personal profiles. Yeah. A lot of that is being done by very um, highly paid businesses, um, Cambridge Analytica, Palantir, and those sort of things. Okay. Um, I think media people we need to also look at those and, and bring them to the attention of the company. Absolutely. And I mean, Cambridge Analytica is a, is a really seminal example because it was Carol by Wallader from The Observer in the UK who spent about a year in the internet. Uh, what we do is open source. So, so, so open source research is research that you can find publicly online. The whole problem with the dark ads, with that kind of targeted marketing, is that it's not quite open source in the same way. Because if I'm not in the target group, I'm not going to see it. Um, one of the things which has worked really well is crowdsourcing. So, particularly uh, on the encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, there's lots of, of this info going around. You can't track WhatsApp in the same way you can track Twitter. So, so what people have done is they've, they've actually crowdsourced. They said, you know, if you're in a WhatsApp group and you see a story that you're worried about, share it, send it to a central point, and we can look at it and fact check it and let you know. Right? Um, so, with with the Cambridge Analytica story, it's the combination of actually getting getting somebody in the company to blow the whistle on it in the end. So, it's the good old late work journalism, which really confirmed the story. And, and it's the same way with, with the Internet Research Agency and St. Petersburg. The reason we know so much about it is that a couple of trolls came out of this. And actually, very early on, a couple of really, really good Russian investigative journalists managed to penetrate the, the, the operation like six weeks after it was set up. I mean, they, they were in on the ground floor pretty much. It was the legwork journalism that did. So you're, you're absolutely right, that's a big problem, it's a big challenge. It's difficult for the open source community to work on it because it's not open in the same way. You can't see it. But that's where the that's where the real journalism comes in, and you can combine the crowdsourcing and trying to find a whistleblower and then data analysis, and you can put bits together. The other thing is that, that particularly Facebook has now woken up to add transparency, and and they're rolling out transparency measures so that paid political adverts have to be published. Who it's from, um, who's been seeing it. There was a I think in India they, they released the initial database just at the beginning of this week, I think. Um, and they were actually saying, right, so, so, so this ad was paid for by this company and targeted this, this issue, and here's the number of you know, men who clicked on it, women who clicked on it, and I don't remember if it went down to the age range as well. So, so and transparency is coming, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's a challenging issue, and the best way to deal with it is the combination of, of online and actual on the ground. Okay.
tweet from an account you don't know who the people are. Why are you embedding that, for example? The other thing is it's not just Twitter, right? There's all the stuff that goes on on Facebook, there's all the stuff that goes on Instagram, there's all the stuff. Like Instagram is tailor made for propaganda because all you need is a meme and like two words. If you're a foreign interferer, you're looking at Tinder, English, Tinder, right? WhatsApp is a great big word. I mean, in, in India, there's all kinds of concerns over there. So you, it's cross platform, it's, it's everywhere. You need to be very, very aware of it. You need to, but also bear in mind that we're not in 2016. There's guys like Mike, there's guys like Chris, there's Amanda, there's Sarah, there's guys like, like Arnstein, right? You are getting a burgeoning field of people who are studying this all the time and are looking out for it. And so 2016 was the, was the seismic year. We had the, the double whammy of you know, Brexit and then the Trump election, right? That was huge. And, and the amount of slur on social media and disinfo on social media played a massive part in that. But we're two and a half years down the line and on that. The platforms have totally woken up. You can always argue should they be doing more, but at least they're not saying fake news is more my platform, you've got to be crazy. Okay. That was 2016. You've got a research community out there. There's more and more knowledge. And frankly, if trolls were any good at their job, they wouldn't be doing trolling and doing something else. <laughs> yeah, they're really, really good at that without the food chain. So it, it, it's a challenge, but it's not a challenge which is unbeatable. It's about having the awareness and having just some of the basic skills like reverse searching, like thinking about a Twitter flow and thinking about how many people are posting on this, right? So, so yes, it's right to be worried, but this is not 2016. We've come a long way since then. And there are guys like Chris and Carl and Matt and Sarah who, who are doing work on this. So, so be aware. Oh, don't necessarily be afraid. I'm going to find one of the best examples of the trajectory of this actual protest movement, hashtags use must fall. Why is it just a hashtag that comes from the social media? Yeah. And it ends up on the back of a bus in Cape Town saying, hashtag please must fall. This word broke and charged me too much money. Yeah. It's like, let's look around to you. Yeah, it could be like that. I'm always talking about the, the, the propaganda that exists on social media, the amount of people that are actually seeing it versus um, that it doesn't have a big enough effect to actually look against an election. Absolutely. It's really, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just in a country that doesn't obviously have like that much access to like, data and not everyone's on social media, I'm more just trying to gauge. So like, yeah. anyway, that's what I would have to talk about. We're not turning on those people on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And those campaigns. No, for sure. It, it's also worth bearing my story. We will get it. Um, it's going to vary from election to election as well. I mean, I think it was the, the Mexican election. Sure, there, you know, there was disinfo online, but. but the winner was the winner by so like 25 points or something. It was such a massive gap. Yeah. There's no way you can overturn that with, with social media. In the same way in the French election, it was about kind of 65% Macron, 35% Le Pen or something like that. Even with the Macron leaks thing, frankly, even if we hadn't spotted where it was coming from, that wasn't going to be enough to swing it. So, so you know, if you're looking at a race where one guy's on 90% and one guy's on 10, you know who's going to win. No amount of messaging is going to be on digital is going to change the brand. But it's when you're looking to the tight races, it's when you're looking to there's a couple of, you know, there's a fraction of a point in it between one and the other. That's where a, a, a heavyweight online campaign can do enough just to tip the balance. So, so the context is important as well. How many people live in America? 350 million? 350 million? Yeah. Only 66 million of them on Twitter. That's very and important. that's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, having said that and all that, uh, the insane and the living attack cases and all of that, also in, in countries like many here in Africa where we have the potential for volatility in the election context, that shows the danger as well. But my actual question is this is a perception thing actually. All of these issues seem to be being put sort of on the desks of private organizations, private people, the Facebook sort of world in uh, that fiasco that happened with the digital media. Um, but to what degree do, does, or do, do tutorial authorities engage with organizations like um, 
to other people or governments or government agencies that actually pursue this actively and say there's a potential to do real damage here. How can we engage as journalists and people to actually do something about it? So, so what you're getting there's, there's a worldwide debate on um, as to how law enforcement and <coughs> should get involved. The classic example is the, um, the UK uh, Digital Water Media and Sport Committee just came out with this big report slamming Facebook and saying, look, now we need to have regulation for platforms. Um, Singapore has been discussing a fake news law. France has been discussing a fake news law. Germany has got its laws in place. That there are all kinds of different legislative issues going on. There's a couple of big problems there. One of which is that if platforms are international, are you going to subject them to 182 different laws? And if you're going to say, right, in Germany, you have to give over all the user data, what are you going to do in Saudi Arabia and Russia, where somebody who tweets the wrong thing ends up in jail? Big problem, right? So, so, so there's a certain extent to which legislating on it opens a whole new kind of world. Sure. The other example is that the, um, the French, one, the, the early draft of the French fake news law was that in the pre election period, so like five or six weeks before the election, um, if a piece of false content related to the election was posted online, it had to go to a judge, and the judge would have 48 hours to decide whether it should be taken down. And then the judge would rule that and plan to take it online. Now, in terms of the legal process, 48 hours is a flash of lightning, right? You know, cases have gone for years. In terms of the internet, that's four times forever. When Donald Trump tweeted the word Kofefe and then fell asleep, he had 100, there were 100,000 mentions of Kofefe in 41 minutes. Yeah, I mean, you give it 48 hours, it's gone. And you are never getting that back. So, so part of the problem is legislation and particularly legal action are slow. The internet is fast. So there needs to be flexibility. So something I always bang on about is that there, you need to have um, hotlines set up, particularly like with between election bodies and the platforms. And they need to actually do, um, they, need to, they need to exercise. You know, six months out from the election, you need to have the IEC sitting down with the platforms and saying, right, let's do an exercise. What happens if on the day of the vote, suddenly a video goes viral saying that you know, ethnic group A has started macheting ethnic group B in a certain township and it's all the the election. That's going viral. You've now got 20 minutes to solve that problem before real people start running. What do we do? If it's a real life situation, you haven't got time to go through the phone book. You, there needs to be some kind of much more flexible approach in place. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, news cycle is so important. We got, we got dead lucky in the French election. Reuters rang me early on and because I recognize the names. So I think Reuters rang me at about 10 o'clock at night. By about 11 o'clock, I had the data with them. Their story was on, on, on the wire in the early hours of the morning. So, so less than six hours after Macron's hashtag started trending, we had the story up where it came from. So we were in the same news cycle, we were people never pegging the original story. It's the speed which is so important, and that's why so much is important that, that media are able to do this and actually able to share the real story. One other point, I, I love your point about the volatility. Something which always sort of comes up on the edge of open source research is that what we do is the technical side, but actually what, what matters is the emotional. And if you're thinking about teaching people digital literacy, for me the number one thing is always to tell people if a headline makes you angry, take a step back and ask who's trying to make me angry and what's in it for them. Because so much of the disinfo we see is about switching people's brains off. It's about make, making people so angry or so afraid they'll fall for anything. It's about weaponizing the hatred and the fear. I mean, look at the old right, they're the masters of this. They, they just hate markets. But they trigger people's fears, and that's how they get hold of And so teaching people is a really, really first step. If you see something that makes them angry, don't click on it. Look where it's coming from first and think, who's trying to manipulate me and how? And that's something where, you know, I, I say in conference, but it's not the conference people who talk about. That's where you just communicate to people, calm down. The internet is all about emotion. It's like, oh, I've got to share it now. So you, know, you, can you can turn off Twitter for 24 hours and you will not die. And life will go on. You'll realize it's a world out there. Right? So it's teaching people the emotional aspect as well. Hey, uh, by the way, that is a point about that is that the, uh, is the reason we, another reason I'm passionate about fighting with depression is that this creates opportunities for governments to, to say we need to be. Access to the internet because of this. Same as with traditional media, 
Pojďme vidět na vládu ambasovní centrále, kam se budí všichni na kartu. Ej, vás prostě to bude tvoj vědělá v těch žvědě, těch vědělá v těch zvů. Já už jim, to je nemá. Ale vám to vám, ale vás nemá vám? Um, I just actually want to want to ask about a, a deeper thing. This is thank you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful presentation all around from everyone. I hope to everyone. Um, it's just that it, it's easy to forget that you can't make someone do something if there's not already some compulsion there. So it's easy to use the the, the fake news. Etc. A very real thing to to obscure genuine problems like, like the yellow vests, fees must fall. These things didn't happen because of Twitter. So just yeah, I mean, is there there's a difference between fake journalism and bad journalism, and both are actually bad. Um, how can you address the, the fake journalism problem while Still keeping people aware of bad journalism. I, part of it is if you, you can teach people some really, really basic skills and understandings. Um, you know, tell them that ABC accuracy, balance, credibility of sources. You can teach them how to look for this information. Um, but what you're what you're really doing in the open source field is you're looking for the actual. Look for what's actually false. Is it whether it's factually false or is it a false account or a false application or the real advantage we now have again is this is where things have turned on their head in 2016. But I called the Russian interference in the US election in March 2016. But most people thought that you come on, you're making it up, you're a Russophobe. And there was also, yeah, but Putin's going to win anyway. Why does it matter what's a footprint? Those days are over. And coming back to the emotion point, one of the reasons that the disinfo works so well is it always tells a good story. It's a story that people want to believe. It's a story that hooks people in, in that inner thing that they're really passionate about. But actually, something that more and more people are really passionate and interested in now is how do you bust this info? How this info works? And so, if you can, it, it's not just saying this story is false, but you can tell them the story, like, like with, with mathematics. It's not just, oh, here's the number of tweets and here's the timeline, but it started in the old writing in the US and then moved by WikiLeaks and then it came to France. But the story, is that the far right in America and WikiLeaks are trying to torpedo up Emmanuel Macron and then the French? Yeah, but so, so, something, I mean, Brexit happened despite, you know, right. apart from all, all the, the lies and the smoke screens and all of that, Brexit happened because there was, there was a real unhappiness on the ground because of austerity, because of various things. So, you can address the. Show me the question that didn't happen because of the happiness or because of the capital out on the unhappiness. So well, one of the interesting things with the Russian operation was it, it didn't just target the old right, it didn't just Trump, target Trump support, it targeted everybody, all the way from Black, Black Lives Matter all the way through the white supremacists. But what you saw them doing during the campaign is they saw the ones which worked best, and then they doubled down on those, and they were ones with, well, they were targeting Native Americans, they never got any of them, they trying it. And then at some point it kind of tailed off, and they worked out what they were, what it was most profitable to focus on. And you're absolutely right. If disinfo falls on people who are disinterested, it's never going to get anywhere. If you like, what disinfo is doing is putting a big red flag and saying, hey, here's a community which is really vulnerable. For the policymakers, if they see disinfo targeting a certain community and really radicalizing it, they need to think not, not just, hey, let's take out the disinfo. Why is that community so unhappy? Why are people so pissed off that they're willing to believe all this rubbish going around? So, so partly this info serves as a warning flag that there is a big societal problem going on. If it's not addressed, then it's going to be an open world experience. Guys, I'm going to stop there. The 35 minutes over, which is bad. Thanks very much, Amanda. We're going to talk a bit about security. If you want to uh, hook up with us in terms of VPNs and stuff, please do. Uh, thanks to Carl, who was missing his mother's birthday before Pizza. Yes. Actually, we're going to rush around and uh, probably to buy a present at the gas station. And thanks a bit for flying from uh, Scotland. Yeah. Thank you guys.